GlaxoSmithKline, or GSK, is one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. Now, the company has a portfolio of products for major diseases such as cancer, diabetes, infections, and mental health. It was also the first pharmaceutical company in the world to discover the antiretroviral drug for the treatment of HIV. I caught up with GSK CEO Sir Andrew Witte on the sidelines of the Forbes Healthcare Summit here in New York, and I started by asking him to share some of his thoughts on the price of AIDS and HIV drugs that are currently available in the market today. At GSK, we were the discoverer of the very first HIV drug back in the 1980s, and we've recently launched a whole new generation of medicines into HIV, so we've been there all the way through. Uh, what I can say to you is, first of all, that original set of medicines are now all generic, so they're all available at very low cost. And I'm very proud to tell you that our newest generation of product was launched essentially at parity to the previous generation. So we haven't increased prices beyond what was there before. So we believe that for the impact that's been delivered, the prices are very, very reasonable. They deliver the return that's needed to incentivize future research, because the only way we can improve is to continue to research. And what people are able to now see the benefit of are all those lower prices as generic medicines of the older products come along. There's a lot of price wars that occur in your industry. How does GSK, for example, set prices on drugs? Well, in many countries in the world, prices are not really set by the drug company at all. They're set by negotiation between the drug company and the government. So if you think about Europe and many countries in Asia, it's really a, a dialogue between the, the buyer, the government, and the company. And those conversations can take a very long time. Now, what the company is trying to do is to generate a reasonable return for the innovation risks. Some of our drugs take between seven, eight, maybe 15 years to develop, and we'll have spent hundreds of millions of dollars of risk money to get to the stage of launch. So we believe there needs to be a, a, a compensation for that. You obviously have the cost of making the drug itself. And as you put that into the mix, you also want to think about what value does this create? So are we delivering a medicine which can replace other costs in the healthcare system? And is there a way in which we should be recognized for that? So it's a reasonably complicated set of components which then go into the negotiation. Now then what happens after that is typically you have market competition. So if other companies come along, say two or three years later, that creates new price competition and prices fall. And sometimes governments cut prices. Andrew, your operations in China are very significant. Last year, GSK was caught up in a bribery scandal which saw the company being fined roughly $500 million. As a CEO, when you find out that such a thing has occurred, what was your reaction to the whole scandal? Well, I think the, the only way you can describe my reaction to that is profound sadness. I mean, it's extremely disturbing when, when accusations are made like that. And then, they, obviously, you, you kick into a focus on you have to find out what's happened, and then you have to fix what's happened, and you have to make sure um, that we um, resolve the situation. And that's what we've worked hard to do. We've also demonstrated that we're brave. We're the first company to commit to fundamentally changing the way medicines are sold. So we're the only company in China which does not pay our representatives bonuses according to how much they sell. We're the only company in China that doesn't pay doctors to speak on our behalf. And I hope that after the bad news of a couple of years ago, I hope that China and the people of China will start to see that GSK is a company that loves China, believes in China, wants to work for China, but is also going to contribute to the positive progression of China by being brave in the, change, in the way in which we change our business model. According to some estimates, drug spending in China is expected to reach $185 billion by 2018, and that's a lot of money. So when you see those kind of estimates being presented to you, does your strategy for growth in China change? Do you now have to approach it with a, perhaps a little bit more aggression? Well, our, our strategy for China is a little different to others, I think. We're about trying to ensure that we drive a volume business, not just, if you will, a small volume, high price business. And that's not just true for China, but for other countries, in, particularly in the rapidly developing or emerging economies. Um, and so for, for us in China, our strategy is much more around what's the right level of price which can give very big access. So if anything, actually, what you're seeing GSK do at this time is reduce its prices in China, 
Pfizer recently announced their acquisition of, of Allergan. It's a very contentious deal because if it goes through, it would create the world's largest drug maker. In the United States, we've seen a lot of opposition from politicians here, um, you know, due to perhaps monopolizing the industry and also for tax inversion deals that have happened because of it. What is your take on the Pfizer Allergan deal? And when you see a mega merger like this taking place in your industry, is there cause for concern? I am not in love with the idea of mega mergers in our sector. My company is a product of a mega merger, in fact two mega mergers in the late 1990s and the year 2000. And actually after both of those mergers we were the world's biggest drug company. Pfizer was the world's biggest drug company after all of its mergers, but it is not today. It's not just about being the biggest and mergers don't help you permanently be the biggest and I'm not sure it's good to be the biggest it's better to be the best. Now, what does best mean? Best means the best in the research labs, producing great new medicines. We recently announced we have now 40 new medicines coming through our late development pipeline. I feel really good about that. Being best in the way we commercialize our medicines. We're the world's, I think, bravest company in terms of innovating our commercial model, stopping paying representatives bonuses for sales, stopping paying doctors speak on our behalf. We've just gained approval for the world's first malaria vaccine where we've promised to make no profit from that vaccine. So for me, it's around how do you stay best in those things? Personally, I think the very big mergers and acquisitions can distract you from that focus.